Are you suffering from a frozen shoulder? If you suffer from a frozen shoulder, then this video is for you. Hi, I'm Dr. Dave Candy, and in this video, I'm gonna tell you what causes a frozen shoulder, what the symptoms are, and why it's different from adhesive capsulitis, plus what you can do to relieve shoulder pain from a frozen shoulder and get your shoulder to move better. Plus, I'll give you some interesting tidbits that you may not read in a textbook or find anywhere else on Google, just based on my years of experience treating frozen shoulders. Now, if you find this video helpful, give it a like or thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you can get notified of our future videos. So first of all, what causes a frozen shoulder? A frozen shoulder is typically referred to as adhesive capsulitis, and those two terms are used interchangeably. But Adhesive capsulitis, I think, is actually a subgroup of frozen shoulder, that everyone with adhesive capsulitis has a stiff, sore shoulder that can't move, but not everyone with a stiff, sore shoulder that can't move has adhesive capsulitis. What adhesive capsulitis refers to is an inflammation of the capsule around the shoulder where it scars down and it restricts the shoulder from moving. But those aren't the only things that can cause a shoulder to freeze. Now, ironically, when you think of inflammation, you think of heat and hot, and so it's kind of a misnomer to call it a frozen shoulder. Maybe a stiff or a stuck shoulder would be a better name. But anyway, that's what we have. A uh, frozen shoulder, a lot of times I've found, is actually more of a neurological and metabolic disorder. And from treating lots of patients with frozen shoulders, I've found that in almost every case, there's some underlying nerve problem in either the neck or the brachial plexus. Now, if you think about the people who typically get frozen shoulders, it's much, much, much more common in diabetics. It's common in women age 40 to 60, kind of in the perimenopausal years. It's more common in people who have thyroid disorders, which also kind of tends to come on in those years. It's more common in people who have heart problems or a recent injury like a stroke or a rotator cuff that makes them stiffen their shoulder up. Now, people with diabetes are much more prone to having neurological disorders like diabetic neuropathy, and they don't heal as quickly. And so it makes them more likely to, you know, stiffen their shoulder up, which can cause a true adhesive capsulitis. But even in the case of where there's not a true adhesive capsulitis, if you have a really irritable, sore nervous system and it hurts to move your shoulder, you're just going to stop doing it. And a lot in a lot of patients who have a frozen shoulder that don't really have a true adhesive capsulitis, they'll get almost this like withdrawal protective response that their nervous system is trying to protect them from moving into an uncomfortable range. So the way that you treat a frozen shoulder really depends on one, is it a true adhesive capsulitis? Or two, is it more of a neurometabolic disorder that you would treat more like any other nerve or metabolic disorder? Now, the treatment for a typical frozen shoulder, the evidence-based treatment shows that physical therapy and corticosteroid injections are the most common treatments. Now, you read in the literature that it takes 12 to 24 months for a frozen shoulder to heal. And I don't know about you, but if you have a frozen shoulder, that's a really, really, really long time to be in pain and not be able to use your arm correctly. Now, you may have heard of things or may have Googled a one minute shoulder, frozen shoulder fix. And that's also probably not real. If it sounds too good to be true, it, it truly is. But there are some things that you can do to speed up your shoulder recovery so that it doesn't take one to two years to unfreeze a frozen shoulder. So again, the evidence-based treatment is corticosteroid injections and physical therapy. Now, what kind of physical therapy, you might ask? Uh, it shouldn't be incredibly painful stretching where your therapist takes your hand and cranks it way up as far as it can go, and you shouldn't feel like you're suffering throughout the entire treatment. If you're currently getting that type of treatment, I would stop and find somewhere else. If you happen to be in St. Louis, we'd be happy to help you out. But it, it, treatment for shoulder pain shouldn't be incredibly painful. It should, however, be hands-on. There's evidence that shows that you know, manual moving of the joints and you know, potentially some dry needling has also been shown to be helpful for a frozen shoulder. Now, what exercises might you do for a frozen shoulder? Again, that kind of depends on the root cause of the problem, but there's no standard set protocol. 
in general, I'm a big fan of the keep it simple stooping principle or the KISS principle. That there's no one set of exercises that's going to be perfect. If you've got a sore shoulder, try to move it as best you can, as often as you can, but not to the extent that it's causing pain. Because when you overstretch a stiff sore shoulder or anything, any nerve that's you know, really irritable, then it's going to go into protective response. And the long-term result of that may be you may stretch it a little bit farther for the time being, but the end result is that it ends up getting stiffer over time and it doesn't really help you progress. So taking a backdoor approach where, you know, if you have a stuck stock, sock drawer and you try to jam it in really hard, it's just going to get more stuck. So taking more of a finesse approach and finding things where you can move easily is a better way to go about it. Now, in general, the motions that you want to improve on are you know, reaching upwards, going out to the side, and the motion of reaching behind your back. Any exercise that you can do to facilitate that in a pain-free manner is helpful. Now, other exercises that you may not think of that are good for frozen shoulder, again, goes back to the fact that at the root cause of them, many of them are neurologic and metabolic disorders. Again, think about diabetes, think about high cholesterol or cardiovascular disease. Um, those things require a different set of exercises beyond just stretching. Now, first of all, if you have diabetes, you want to get regular cardiovascular exercise. That can be low impact things like walking, riding a bike, probably not running because you're doing a lot of arm movement. You can use an elliptical. If it's not a very irritable shoulder yet, you might use the arms on that. If it's more irritable, you may just use an elliptical where you don't use your arms on it. But getting some sort of cardiovascular exercise to help improve blood flow to the area, to help lower your blood sugar if that's a concern for you, um, are some good treatments, some good exercises for shoulder pain. Now, diet also plays a role in treating a frozen shoulder. That again, if you have diabetes or high cholesterol, that can affect your tissue healing and our risk factors for a frozen shoulder. So controlling your blood sugar through diet, cutting down on excess sugars, limiting how many processed foods that have hidden carbohydrates, hidden sugars, hidden saturated fats and cholesterol in them are good points. But trying to stick more to protein rich foods, fiber rich foods, especially vegetables. So fruit is good in moderation, but keep in mind that it does have sugar in it. So you don't want to go overboard on your fruits. Just generally cleaning up your diet and avoiding processed foods is a good way to start. Now, if you have other concerns like a autoimmune disease or a thyroid disorder, avoiding foods that may be triggers for you. Gluten is a common example. Wheat, soy, dairy, corn. Um, those are some other really common food allergens. But if you notice that you have foods that trigger your symptoms, you may want to also cut back on those things. So hopefully you found that information helpful and it gets you started on finding a good treatment for your frozen shoulder. Now, if you do need some more help to treat your frozen shoulder, feel free to reach out and we'd be happy to help. And if you found this video helpful, give it a like, a thumbs up, and subscribe to our channel so you can get notified of our other future videos. Thanks and have a great day.